Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I want to talk about Stephen Erickson's The Malazan Book of the Fallen. In particular, it, well, it-ish, because some of them are related, points about the series that I think are helpful to know before you go into it. And the reason I want to do this is when people discuss this series, there are a lot of buzzwords thrown around. There are a lot of misconceptions thrown around. There's a lot of terminology thrown around about it. And I'm trying to nail it down to make it as concrete and as concise as I possibly can, given how much I ramble. But I thought this would be helpful for anyone trying to decide whether or not a 10 book series like the Malazan Book of the Fallen is something that they want to read. Because I can go, oh, it is the world's greatest series. And that will actually mean nothing to you because you're not me. And we're going to have different preferences. So what I thought I would do is talk a little tiny bit about what the series actually is, some preconceptions that people have, and then answer some of the frequently asked questions about this series. So the first thing is, it is, it's a 10 book series. But like Ian M. Banks' Culture series or Terry Pratchett's Discworld series, it is not a chronological sequence following a single group of characters. If you think that a series must be a small group of characters going on a singular journey, that's not what these books do. It, it just isn't. It is a 10 book series. There are a couple of overarching concepts that run through. There are thematic links that run all the way through. There are recurrent characters that run all the way through. But it is not following a main character or a core group or a quest group on a journey from A to Z. That is not what is happening in this series. And I think that expectation can actually throw a lot of people off because in the modern fantasy genre, when someone says series, we tend to think almost in terms of trilogy. And because of that, we have an expectation that there's going to be a small core group of characters. That's who we're going to follow all the way through as if it is some sort of simple, straightforward action movie. What this is actually closer to, if you want to go for a sort of literary example, is a mosaic novel where each of the 10 books, give or take, is set up to illustrate a particular thing that when you clip them all together, you get the overarching picture. Just as in a mosaic novel, it is a number of short stories that may or may not appear linked. But once you've read all of them and you think about them all together, you understand the bigger picture. So that is one thing to bear in mind. The second thing is, while a lot of genre fantasy focuses very heavily on stories being told to us, that is not how the Malazan Book of the Fallen is written. And I will get on to more details about that later. But this is not so much a story being told to us as a sequence of events that we as reader are witnessing. And that is actually a very important distinction because it comes down to if you are a witness to a sequence of events, no one is telling you who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, who should win, who shouldn't win. You're simply witnessing the events and then having to decide those things for yourself. And so that is an important aspect as well. And one of the best analogies that that I can think of to describe what you should be expecting in reading the Malazan Book of the Fallen beyond any of the sort of genre aspects, but in terms of the structure, in terms of what we are seeing, is to think of, for example, World War II. And if someone was going to write a 10 book series about the entirety of World War II, where book one focused on uh, Germany and their expansion. And then book two focused on the Pacific campaign. And then book three focused on Italy. And book four focused on Africa. And then book five, do you see what I mean? 
that as each of the different theatres are brought in as the focus of a single novel, there will be new characters. There will be different on the ground objectives that those characters are focused on. But when you take that step back, you realize that each book is giving us insight into how all of thing, all of these things fit together to give us the picture of World War II. So that's kind of a, a very vague, rough, broad discussion of the structure of the Malazan Book of the Fallen without giving away plot details, because I know people get very upset about spoilers. Another thing to recognize about the Malazan Book of the Fallen is one of the key aspects that links everything together are thematic considerations, the themes that run through it, where different events are shown in different ways to evoke specific themes. And those themes line up and are sympathetic and support each other all the way through the series. And it might sound airy-fairy, it might sound very literary, blah, blah, blah. But that's at the heart of this. And it is something that I think, uh, A, helps set the Malazan Book of the Fallen apart from a lot of other series, but also B, is, is something that makes it transcend mere entertainment and actually give it a longevity and interest because it speaks to the human condition. It speaks to those resonances within us. It helps us identify aspects of a story that is otherworldly, but related to aspects of our own life. And I think that is important. So now let's talk about some of the slightly more specific things. And one of the one of the more frequent misconceptions that I that I hear about the Malazan Book of the Fallen is you need to reread the Malazan Book of the Fallen to really understand it. And this is fundamentally false. No other way to put it. You do not need to reread. If you choose, after reading it the first time, to reread, you will get more out of it. But you don't need to. There is enough that is clearly communicated to the reader on a single read, on your first read through, that you will understand 90% of everything that happens. You will understand all of the important events. Will you understand everything? No, you don't have the context for everything. The first book starts in media res. In fact, the entire story is a snapshot of an historical event told from a grunt's eye view. We don't have an omniscient perspective looking down and pointing out to us as reader who all the important people are, what the important events are. We are on the ground with these people with their limited subjective knowledge of what is going on, going on around them, and we are following them. And they can be mistaken about what is happening. They can be confused about what is happening. They might know what the end goal is because they are living it. So when you reread, you have the complete context. And because you have the complete context, it is as if now when you start that reread, it's like reading a new series all over again. Because although the plot points, those narrative events are going to be the same beats all the way through, they will have a completely different resonance now because we understand the overarching picture. We know how they fit into the big picture, the mosaic that has been created. We understand all of these things. So now we can see elements of the foreshadowing. We can understand those elements of foreshadowing. We can understand the context of why certain events happened the way that they did. We have better insight into which characters are really important, what character actions are really important. We suddenly know all of those things. So it can feel, when you reread it, almost as if you're reading a new series. So I suppose one way of looking at this is you buy 10 books and you get two series out of it. A second point that I frequently hear talked about is the series doesn't really get going until, and it's usually book two, book three, book four, whatever the, uh, the particular person has chosen as their one where they think it really gets going. And 
I vehemently disagree with this. And that's not to say that that isn't when these things worked for those readers. But the series does truly begin with Gardens of the Moon. And the reason that I think, and I could be wrong, but the reason I think a lot of people say it doesn't really get going until X, until Dead House Gates or Memories of Ice or um, House of Chains, is because usually that will be the book that that reader tuned into and accepted and relaxed into the style that Erickson was using when he wrote this series. One of the difficulties that people have with the Malazan Book of the Fallen is that not only does it start in media res, which let's face it, not really the common technique we expect from a lot of fantasy writing. We expect that very straightforward Freytag's pyramid of introduction. Let's set out who everyone is instigating event this is going to be linked to where the story is going and it's going to set our heroes off on an adventure the rising action oh tensions are building the heroes are going through their trials climax oh they are now confronting the thing that was set off with the instigating event falling action who phew wasn't that great denouement look how the world ended up that pattern is so prevalent in genre fantasy that we sometimes forget that it's not the only structure that can be used. The Malazan Book of the Fallen does away with that. Now, I dislike the term handholding, but it is a term frequently used for a style of storytelling in which the author is making sure to feed you artificially or organically a lot of the information so you understand all of the context and all of the different elements from the very beginning. A lot of information is front loaded. It's stuffed into the front of the novel so that you can feel safe and secure that you understand what the major things are. And then quite often they rely on complex narrative events or the mechanics of the narrative events to create the appearance of complexity. Erickson doesn't do that. That's not how he has written the series. The series is written very much like a short story. And by this, I mean, short story writing is different in a lot of respects to the writing of a novel. Each of the scenes in each of the chapters in each of the books can function almost as a short story in and of itself. So when people say it doesn't really get going until X, it's usually more to do with when that reader feels comfortable with not only the writing style, but also has gathered enough of the context and understanding of the world that they feel comfortable and more immersed. Does the series improve over time? Of course, it was written over a decade and with every subsequent volume, and this is true for the vast majority of authors, their books improve, their writing improves. They fall more into the groove of what readers are expecting because they've had feedback over time about what is working, what is popular. So yeah, a lot of that happens in the Malazan Book of the Fallen too. One of the things that sometimes annoys me is the, the uh, complaint, there is no plot or the plot isn't obvious or it's not a bite plot. And that is just not true. Plot refers to the sequence of narrative events as we encounter them in the novel. And in this series, there are a lot of narrative events. There are huge battles. There are magical battles. There are small scale fights and battles. There are duels. There are poignant scenes. There are tragic scenes. There is a lot in these novels. And just because there isn't a clear oh, look, there's an evil dark lord over there and we must defeat them, doesn't mean that there isn't a story, that there isn't a plot. It's just that the overarching plot, the overarching narrative, the overarching story, that only becomes fully revealed to the reader as you go along each of the books. It is not obvious from the first novel. However, elements of it are there from the first novel. It doesn't wait 
until X to get going. There is a plot from the very beginning. But each book, like I said, in terms of an analogy to, the, to a world war, is set in a different location. And each of those things gives you insight into the greater conflict. Now, another point that frequently gets brought up is that Ericsson is bad at characterization. And again, I would have to say that I disagree. What Ericsson does is, first of all, there are a lot of characters. Like I said at the beginning, you aren't following one or two or even a small group of characters. There are a lot of characters weaving in and out of this grand epic narrative. And because of that, you don't spend hundreds of thousands of pages with one character. And as a result, it challenges uh, a preconception that we have that, oh no, but you know, I'm all about reading about these characters. The thing is, the characters in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, significant number of them, you care about and come to care about very, very deeply. And these are characters who Ericsson can sometimes create in one or two paragraphs, can create a character that you can grow to love in a couple of paragraphs. The characterization, I suppose the style of it, is, e is more easily described as implied characterization. Everything is external, just as when we meet people out in the street. They don't explain their entire backstory. We don't have access to their internal thoughts. They don't tell us everything honestly. They may lie to us, give us half-truths, disguise things, hold information back. That's what happens in this book. And a lot of that then means that we as reader have to be more active in decoding the information. The information is all there, but it's not obvious that a lot of it is implied. And my favorite go-to example for this is always when someone comes up to you and they're going to break up with you and they go, oh, it's not you, it's me. They clearly mean it's you, but they said it's not you, it's me. Surface level meaning, oh, it isn't you. The actual meaning, no, 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 it, it's you. There are implications wrought all the way through Ericsson's description, Ericsson's dialogue, everything. All of it adds to characterization. A military character will have a different style of speaking, will see the world differently, and will use different words in their description of the world around them because they think about it in military terms. And this, I think, is one of the great aspects of this because this is a truly engaging style of writing. And when we are willing to spend the time to actively read, to engage with the text, it can become incredibly immersive and incredibly fulfilling. Whereas if a story is told to us, that can be highly entertaining, but we are much more passive. So again, it's not necessarily that this is the best way to do something, but it's Ericsson's choice. That's the choice he made for the writing of these books. And because of that, it's not that there's bad characterization, it's that the characterization is done differently to how it usually is done in the genre. It's all about the world building. Now, I think this is one of those things that, that typically gets said, and it's not meant as a bad thing, but it kind of gives the wrong impression. The world of the Malazan Book of the Fallen was co-created with another author called Ian C. Esselmont. And both Ericsson and Esselmont and their friends created, refined, and gamed a homebrew D&D um, &D and then GURPS world. And because of that, they had all of these games, they designed different kingdoms, different characters, all of these things through the world. And because of that, the world has an incredible amount of detail and depth. It has hundreds of thousands of years of history. It has an entire pantheon of meddling gods. It has cities and customs and tribes and clans, and it has peoples of every color and creed. It is a truly diverse and engaging world. 
And yeah, that is one of the big draws of the series, a world that is so detailed, it feels real. And for a first time reader, it can feel overwhelming because again, we're so used to only being told those things that we just, you need to know. This is the important thing. Forget about everything else, just this. But when we are in the place of someone who's living there, they make assumptions about the world around them, just as we do about our world. And they're not explaining it to us. We are witnessing it through their eyes. And because of that, it can feel confusing at the beginning. But this is not the focus of the story. The focus of the story are the themes running through it, the lives of the characters who are impacted by these events. And by this one world-shaping event, that by the end you know exactly what it is, and actually when you look back along the 10 Malazan, uh, novels of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, you suddenly realize that was the story all along. So I've talked a little bit about the prose being complicated and dense. Again, something that gets uh, claimed. And it's always framed in this very, very bad way, as a pejorative, as something negative. And it's not. It's written as a short story where when we see a description of something, it's not just the surface level description. Erickson works in secondary meaning. So in that sense of it yeah it is dense there's a lot of information carried by every single sentence or nearly every single sentence i think you know there must be some that are surface level only but the vast majority of the writing in the malazan book of the fallen requires active engagement and if that's not the kind of book that you're looking for then that's absolutely fine it's just a style and this particular style can be incredibly rewarding, particularly when you get used to it. Because suddenly, instead of a simple description of a landscape, the description of the landscape is also setting up tone, is telling you something about the character that is seeing it, is adding to the atmosphere, and may actually foreshadow certain events, all wrapped up in the description. How a character wakes up from unconsciousness, takes you through the event, lets you experience in part, or at least imagine the trauma of this, places you in the scene and is very, very evocative. And it's done through the sequence of the information. It's done through the connection of imagery and the poetic language and the metaphors and the similes and the analogies that are being made. It's done through the description. Everything adds together to create an entire deep, complex, wonderful, rich texture to the narrative. Or, you know, you could complain and say, well, it just would have been simpler if you said, and he woke up. But if you want that style of very simple, straightforward, they just tell you exactly what's happening, then maybe the story isn't for you. And there's no shame in that. But the prose that Erickson employs, his exposition, his dialogue, it is exceptionally good writing. Even at the beginning where people will say Gardens of the Moon is the weakest book and his writing is the weakest and it's a bit rough in places. When people talk about Erickson's writing being a bit rough in places, that's in reference to the rest of his writing, not in reference to the vast majority of other authors who work in the field. Erickson's writing is exceptionally good. The world and the series is grimdark, morally ambiguous. And this is a difficult one because it's going to depend very much on how you personally define grimdark. For me, and I will lay it out for me so you know what I'm saying and why I'm going to argue it the way that I do. Grimdark is usually a style of narrative in which there is a dark, brutal, devastating world full of violence. And the central protagonist or the central protagonists are quite often anti-heroes rather than heroes. And they are often categorized by an unwillingness to let the world beat them, 
they refuse to give in. They rage against the world and they will fight with every fiber of their being, regardless of the cost to themselves or to others, to win. And that is what I see at the heart of a lot of Grimdark. Now, you may have a very different definition of Grimdark, which is absolutely fine. It's a fairly nebulous term. The Malazan Book of the Fallen, for me, is not grimdark. Yes, there's a lot of darkness. Yes, bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people as well. Good things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. In fact, there isn't really, these are the good guys, those are the bad guys. It's not divided that way. It's very much about people on the ground. And it's very much about how... An everyday person is a fully rounded character and they have a complex psychology and they are not easy to cast into a simple binary. I think that Erickson outright rejects the notion of simplistic moral binaries. And he has characters that you grow to love in this series, characters who you think are wonderful, do some horrendous things. And you have characters who do absolutely loathsome things. But ultimately, you can also come to care about. You have of truly villainous characters who we come to understand their villainy. And so we no longer see them as caricatures. We no longer see them as simply evil. We see and are quite critical of their acts. We don't forgive them their acts. But we gain an understanding of how they ended up that way. And that is something, rightly or wrongly, I don't think we see very frequently in Grimdark. But this ties into the last point. And it is a point that can be very upsetting for people. And that is, the Malazan Book of the Fallen is full of sexual and gratuitous violence. And I won't beat about the bush here. There are some quite brutal scenes. There are elements of sexual violence in this series. Not going to lie about it. Not going to shy away from it. I will say, though, that I am of the opinion that none of the scenes are gratuitous. And while... Some of the scenes are certainly disturbing and upsetting and challenging. They are curiously not graphic. The language used on the page is actually fairly clinical. And even then, what is described on the page what is physically rendered is usually the absolute minimum required to get across what is happening in the scene. And one of the reasons I think why, when we think about these scenes, we, we see them as so disturbing, as so graphic, even though they are not, is because our imaginations create scenes that are far more graphic than the words on the page actually describe. Now, we see this quite often in, in other arenas. For instance, when you're reading about a sword fight and there is a single sentence that says, the sweat flew from his brow as their blades clashed repeatedly. And when you're in the middle of reading the scene, you suddenly imagine that as this whole flurry of blows and the sweat flying off their brow, when actually it's just been a single sentence. But we take that one sentence and we create a whole scene out of it. And I think part of what happens with these scenes that, yes, are disturbing, is that our imaginations actually make them a lot bigger, a lot longer, and a lot more detailed than they actually are. 
And that's one point. But also on this point, I think it is important to note that Ericsson's intention, at least as far as I can tell, is always to try to understand the victim and not to fetishize or to turn this into entertainment or to make any of this titillating. I think Ericsson is very much focused on empathy with the victim and trying to understand the victim's perspective and the ramifications of what it means to be a victim. Whether or not Ericsson succeeds at this for you personally is a judgment entirely up to you. But I think that is the focus, that is the drive. And in a genre in which sexual violence against anyone, but particularly female characters, is often used flippantly, facetiously, and as a lazy way to create tension, drama, and backstory. I think Erickson tries very hard not to fall into that trap, and he tries very hard to treat it with empathy, with compassion, and with the attitude that this is important to understand. Again, people may disagree on this point, and it's going to be down to personal preference. But it is not put there just for the hell of it. So those, I think, are the major aspects of this series that frequently get talked about, that are frequently used, often negatively, to discuss the series. And I hope I've given a bit more context to it, at least. Is this series for you? I have no idea. I don't know what your personal preferences are. But I hope in pointing out that this is a series that has amazing characters, an amazing world, huge action set pieces, vast imagination, a deep history. It explores cultural and racial boundaries and tensions. It plays with the expectations that we have about the genre and about storytelling. It has deep thematic connections that run all the way through. It has emotional highs and lows. It has wonderful moments of humor. But it is quite violent. It's epic fantasy. Epic fantasy is quite often full of violence. It has tragedy. It has darkness. It has loss and it has pain. But it also has some of the most wonderful communications of friendship and camaraderie and love. I think The Malazan Book of the Fallen is one of the greatest fantasy series ever written. And I hope it is the series for you. But thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I will see you in the next one.